Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be giving this inaugural Bond speech on global transformation. And today I'm going to be talking about transforming our story, building on some of the things we've been talking about yesterday and we'll be carrying on with later today. But first, I wanted to just give you a bit of context about where I've come on my particular journey. Um, I started working in sustainability about 20 years ago as a marine biologist, and I was fascinated by the sea. I was a fisheries biologist. But I soon realized I was going to spend my whole career saying, if you don't stop catching all the fish, there won't be any fish. Uh, and it was a bit of a kind of realization that I wanted to get into broader campaigning and communication to change the reality on the ground. And so 14 years ago, I co-founded Futera, a specialist sustainability communications agency. And our mission has always been to make sustainability so desirable it becomes normal. And that's with the idea that people will run towards a positive, aspirational vision of the future with more energy and stamina than they will run away from threats of doom and gloom and Armageddon. And 14 years ago, I always joke, working in sustainability was a bit like wetting yourself whilst wearing a dark suit. Uh, no one noticed, but it gave you a warm feeling inside. Uh, now we say sustainability is like teenage sex. Everyone says they're doing it. Very few people actually are. Uh, and those that are doing it are doing it quite badly. Um, these are quite old jokes, but I'm an environmentalist, so I recycle them. But really, the essence of what I'm trying to talk about here is if you want to subvert the dominant paradigm, you have got to have more fun than they are and let them know while you're doing it. It's absolutely paramount that we are having a better time. And as to represent that, this is my team, uh, my international Futera team on away days in Stockholm last year on our fancy dress night. We don't wear these clothes for work, I hasten to add. Um, but I want to kick off with actually quite a cliched image. And we've all seen this image, you know, everyone has used it. It's a very iconic image of Earthrise taken by Apollo 8 in 1968. And I thought it was quite appropriate because, as Carl Sagan, the famous cosmologist, said, he described Earth as this pale blue dot. And I thought, as I was going to be standing in the middle of another pale blue dot and to give you this presentation today, I thought I would kick off with this because we've moved on from that now. This is a photo from 2004. This is the first photo of the Earth from the surface of another planet, from the surface of Mars, taken by the Spirit rover. And it puts us into context about where we really are. And where are we? We're in a tight spot. We're in a really tight spot. You know, I'm speaking to a converted audience of the engaged here. We've been talking about climate change, energy challenges, inequality, migration, biodiversity loss. All of this stuff is grist to our mill. We know we're in a tight spot. We know we're running out of road. And this is the great acceleration, as Will Steffen describes it. And it's humbling to know how quickly this transition has occurred. And if you look at all of these graphs, whether it's the socioeconomic trends on the left or the Earth system trends on the right, there is a magic line around about 1950. And around about 1950, it all started to go wrong. Uh, and that is, as we have tripled our population, we have grown our energy consumption, we have tripled the amount of, uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have changed the world around us. And it's happened fast. And in one way, that can be dispiriting, but equally, if we know how we are cocking up the world, we have a chance of fixing it. So I, I see it as empowering, I see it as inspiring, because what that leaves us in is, as several people have alluded to, is this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous VUCA world. You know, this is the way the Pentagon describes it. You know when the Pentagon is talking about these things that this shit just got real. You know, this is actually physically going on, it's happening. And we need to remember that actually this has all been done in the context of a relatively benign period in history, the Holocene. We have enjoyed, in the last 10,000 years or so, an incredibly stable period of climate in which we have rolled out agriculture around the world and grown most of modern human civilization. Now, during the previous 90,000 years, it was pretty volatile. And you can see, at some of the low points on that fluctuating line, there were only about 15,000 of us left on the planet. We went to the edge, but we came back. And so we are about to disturb the Holocene and enter the Anthropocene, where we are the driving force of the fate of life on Earth. 
Now, that is not about being an arrogant God species. That is about a humbling and awesome responsibility because it's up to us about which direction we choose to drive this in. Do we drive it off the cliff or or do we do a clever, smart U-turn? And one of the most fundamental things we're going to have to realize is that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment and society. It is there for us. We are not there for it. We really have to kind of change the framing of this particular mindset in, in a very real and vital way. Because the market makes a good servant, a bad master, and a terrifying god. You know, we cannot let this rule us. As Vandana Shiva said yesterday, we cannot allow a mental construct like GDP, which has been around for less than a century, to actually override the needs of a planet and a people that have been sustained for millennia. That in itself is a kind of madness. And the greatest illusion we have is the illusion of separation, this cognitive optical delusion that we are separate from each other and that we are separate from the planet that sustains us. And it's only that separation which allows us to treat the planet and other people in instrumental and utilitarian ways. People and the complex web of life that is so vital for our existence are not resources. They are family. They are part of this integrated global web. And we also have got to stop talking about each other as consumers. When we use the linguistic frame of consumption and label people as consumers, we put them into a certain type of behavioral mindset. They become individualistic, isolationist, atomized, selfish, self-interested, demanding their rights, believing that the world works through linear transactional relationships. We need to reframe our people as citizens once again, who are active, engaged, collaborative, collective, who actually believe in an interdependent, collaborative way of engaging with one another. And we are also in our urbanizing century. Over 50% of us now live in cities. This is going to be the greatest transformation that is already underway of people living in urban environments. And we we can learn lessons from history here because this is a crucible, if you like, of where we will succeed or fail. Uh, You know, if you look at the lessons from ancient Rome, one of the reasons for the fall of ancient Rome was the inability to manage the hinterlands to provide the resources that the city needed. In the 21st century, the whole world is our urban hinterland. You know, the entire planet is the hinterland of our cities. And this can lead us into a desert of the real, where we can see the myth of abundance and plenty around us because we are so disconnected from the systems which sustain us. Uh, And that becomes extraordinarily important because the less we experience and are connected to nature, the less we will care about it. So generations brought up in these sterile urban environments will see the world in a very different way. And equally, we're self-obsessed. We're all taking selfies of each other, well, taking selfies of ourselves. Uh, We're imagining ourselves at the heart of the universe as the only thing that matters, where the ego is triumphant and and reigns over all. But this is not about saving the planet. I hate to say this. The planet has been here four and a half billion years. We may leave it in a terrible state, but it will go on without us. This is about saving us. The environmental architect Michael Paulin tells a lovely joke of two planets walking along through space. And one starts itching and scratching and looking very uncomfortable. And the second one says, what's wrong? And the first one goes, I have a terrible case of homo sapiens. And the second one says, don't worry, be gone soon. (laughs) And so we are trying to find what Kate Raworth from Oxfam calls the safe and just space for humanity. The donut. The donut, the idealized donut where we build on a sustainable social foundation of human development, but we live within the environmental ceiling of those nine planetary boundaries that people like Johan Rockstrom and the Stockholm Resilience Center have so elegantly brought to our attention. And undermining all of this, or underpinning all of this, is the notion of story. Now, we've been telling stories since we sat around the first campfires together. You know, they were the ways we exchanged communication as we gazed into those flickering flames. And dogs sniff bottoms, but we tell stories. They are the way that we make sense of the world. They're the way that we understand our relationships with each other and the wider world around us. They define our worldview. 
They are enduring. They are hardwired within us. They are absolutely vital. And stories are the library of humanity. They are the most powerful organizing idea we have ever developed. They help us change our perspective. And, you know, it's not about whether the story is right or the story is wrong. It's whether the story serves us. It's whether the story leads to a world which is better and more sustainable for the many, not the few. Uh, and as the author of His Dark Materials, Philip Pullman, said, after nourishment, shelter and companionship, stories are the things we need most in the world. And we can see how this might happen. We're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where we go from the physiological to a sense of belonging, to the self-actualization at the top of the triangle, where we sublimate to become the Buddha. Um, and we know in the modern age, of course, this is all underpinned by Wi-Fi. Uh, and absolutely nothing can happen uh, without that. But also, we are all wired with the same basic story structure. Joseph Campbell explored this in the monomyth which goes in an anti-clockwise direction, where someone leaves their community, goes on an adventure, a request, faces trials and tribulations, and then comes back and returns and brings wisdom, knowledge, and insight back to the community from whence they came. And this, if you like, is the hero's journey we are now playing out as a species. We are in our trial phase. We're on our adventure, uh, and we need to change. Because our myth of progress is unraveling. We used to think that progress was linear, transactional, inevitable, one-directional. It would go through, that we would come down from the trees and start planting trees. Now we know that progress is not like that. It ebbs and troughs. It, it kind of flows. It peaks. It goes backwards if you take your eye off the ball. And what we're doing at the moment is creating progress traps. You know, where we are, our pursuit of progress is creating impacts which are undermining our potential for future progress. And climate change is a classic case in point, where our pursuit of cheap, abundant, available energy, which has enabled us to build this extraordinary world around us, is now causing climate change, which will undermine our potential for future progress. The important point to note here is we must honor the past. We did not go into that intending to destroy ourselves. But the context has changed. We are waking up. We are realizing the ramifications and the implications of what we've done, and now we need to do something different. So we're not blindly opposed to progress, but we are opposed to blind progress. And our progress, if not blind, is at least partially sighted. And we've talked about this yesterday, but you know, you're all familiar with the, woman, the old woman in the nursery rhyme who swallowed a fly, and then she swallows the spider to catch the fly, and then the bird to catch the spider, and the cat to catch the bird. We do not solve our problems with the same thinking or actions that created them. And yet, on energy, as a kind of illustrative example yesterday that Jeffrey Sachs so eloquently explained, we are doing exactly that. Tar sands, fracking, Arctic drilling. It's a form of insanity. Equally, we are talking about the age of austerity, where it's dispiriting, demotivating, depressing, disconnecting. These are not positive narratives or stories which will inspire us into the action that is required. Because we are in a fundamental state of denial. And denial is a very attractive place to be. Because if you deny the reality in which we find ourselves, then you don't have to change. It's Machiavellian. But the reason we cling to the old stories, which are so seductive and so compelling, and have worked very well for us up till now, which is important to remember, but we're clinging to them because we don't want to change. It's psychologically safe. We go through disavowal. We say, it's not my fault. We go through projection. We say it's China's fault, it's India's fault, it's someone else's fault. We go through regression. Someone else will fix this for us. All of these are natural psychological defenses, but they are preventing us from taking the action required. And so, in that infamous scene in The Matrix, when Keanu Reeves is presented by Morpheus with the two pills, one represents continuing to live in the blissful ignorance of illusion. The other represents the painful truth of a new reality, or the possible optimism of a positive, extraordinary, transformative reality. Because the future's already out there. It's not evenly distributed yet. You know, we are looking at a world in which we have the technology and we have the money. What is missing is the social, cultural, and political will. And that is why we need a new story. And that story cannot be based solely on the facts, the strategies, and the tactics, the numbers, and the data. Data alone is not 
intelligence. Data can help us, but in order to have the drive, we need a narrative which is compelling, which has promise, which has direction, which has momentum, which touches our hearts and our minds, which plays to that side of the brain, which has evocative emotional feeling embedded in it. And if you go back to the very first advertising copywriter, a gentleman called John Powers, he said there are three rules to great communication and storytelling. One, be interesting. Two, tell the truth. Three, live the truth. It's not difficult, but we have to be interesting. We have to capture people's imagination. We have to involve them. We have to get them inspired. Uh, and our language is so sterile and stagnant and stale we need to find a new vocabulary which lifts and transforms this notion of who we are and where we're at. And seven years ago, I had my own personal crisis in Futera. I took a year off and went around the world without flying. And we need to bring this idea of crisis and consciousness together. We need to align the two. And I want to tell you a very short story uh, about that trip. And in this place, which is a little village called Angangueo in the Michoacan Mountains in northern Mexico, and some of you may be familiar with this place because it's the overwintering grounds of the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is the world's best traveled insect. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, invertebrate. It sets off um, every spring and flies all the way to northern Canada uh, and then returns the following autumn um, to this little patch of pine forest in these northern Mexico mountains. Uh, and then you go there, the trees are literally laden during that overwintering season, laden with butterflies. And as the sun warms them up, they take to the air, and you're surrounded by these billions of butterflies. But the reason this is so powerful is because the butterflies which return the following season are the fifth generation of the butterflies that left the previous year. It takes five generations. It's the great-great-grandchildren of the butterflies that left that return the following year. Now, that is the journey that we are embarking on. That is our transformative story. We are not going to fix climate change in your lifetime or my lifetime or even our children's and our great-grandchildren's lifetimes. This is an intergenerational challenge. It's an intergenerational journey. We have to be thinking on those longer timescales. Um, Barbara Kingsolver, the American writer, wrote a fantastic book using a quote uh, from this to illustrate when a climate scientist was challenged once again by a sceptical journalist, and his response is quite damning. He said, we're at the top of Niagara Falls in a canoe. We got here by drifting, but we can't turn around for a lazy paddle back when you finally stop pissing around. We have arrived at the point of an audible roar. Does it strike you as a good time to debate the existence of the falls? <laughs> we're at the point of the audible roar. So we need to do something different. We need to change our perspective. When the astronauts first went up into space, they experienced what psychologists call the overview effect. When they saw the integrated, interdependent vulnerability of the planet in all its fragile beauty in space, they were deeply touched. And these are hard-bitten former military test pilots, as a general rule. And most of them realized that the petty differences that we talk about and our petty squabbles are exactly those, petty and insignificant when given this grand overview. So we have to ask ourselves, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What are you afraid of losing? Things that we're probably going to lose anyway unless we take action. Are we afraid of looking stupid? Are we afraid of making mistakes? Trust me, we're going to look pretty stupid unless we take action. So we need to overcome these fears uh, and, and find something more powerful within us because we need a better purpose. You may have seen the work of Simon Sinek, who talks about the golden circle uh, and this idea of why, the purpose, the reason for existence, whether in your business or, or you as an individual. And we use this a lot in our work uh, with our clients at Futera, because without a purpose that is bigger than yourself, you are likely to serve only yourself. Uh, and some of the most extraordinary transformative challenges are coming out of these, because it's not about shareholder value. We know that. As the cartoon says, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. 
And we need to move beyond that. And some of the pioneering businesses are starting to embrace this sense of higher purpose, of trying to do something for the world in conjunction, of marrying commercial uh, and, and global purpose type uh, pressures. And it's time to get planetary. We actually became planetary 40,000 years ago as we migrated around the world. We're a migratory species. We have been planetary physically for 40,000 years. We haven't been planetary mentally or psychologically yet. And that is the extraordinary journey that we need to embark on now. We need to ask ourselves, who am I? And who are we? And when we say we, we know who we really mean. Because this is water. This is the most obvious stuff that should be fundamental and should be an absolutely obvious in our face reality every single day. The American writer David Foster Wallace talks about this in the context of two goldfish swimming along. Uh, and one, they bump into an old goldfish, and the old goldfish says, all right, boys, how's the water? And the two young goldfish look confused and carry on swimming. One turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? And yet our interdependence and our connection with each other and the planet should be so obvious should be so in our face, should be so front of mind every day that we forget it. And we need to be constantly reminded of it. Because climate change is our civilizational rite of passage. It's our adolescence. It's our growing up time. Every curious, intelligent species like ours is likely to butt up against the limits of the planet that supports it. That's probably an almost inevitable consequence. The question is then, as Sue alluded to yesterday, in the Darwinian context, it's how you react to the change required. And I describe this as an extraordinary emergency which calls for an extraordinary emergence of our consciousness and our ability. Because it's not about this false tension between fixing the economy and the environment. If you think you can't fix both at the same time, then you have a very tiny mind. This is the most dynamic, exciting, innovative challenge that we have ever faced, and we should be rising to it with enthusiasm and energy. Because the world is changing so fast now. Marshall McLuhan, the great communications thinker in the 60s, said, the medium is the message. And when he was saying that, he was saying it in the context of TV as broadcast, of the power of one to many. Now, in the era of the internet, we are now looking at many to many. There are three billion people online now. By 2020, there will probably be five billion. And by 2025, before the Sustainable Development Goals uh, are achieved, we will all be online. Now, that is an extraordinary moment, which I think none of us in here, in this room, could predict what that might mean for our sense of solidarity and our sense of common endeavor. So we are moving into an area of mass communication mass engagement and mass responsibility. And that is an enormously inspiring shift. For the first time in a hundred millennia, we have the potential to craft a common story of one people on our one and only planet. And that, my friends, could be the most extraordinary, wonderful, amazing, true, ancient love story ever told. Thank you very much.